Thank you. And nice to see you all out there. So yes, I was born in New York City, and if my accent doesn't give me away, it doesn't matter how long. I've been in Arizona for 37 years, and every now and then the cowboy's going, what? Uh, so it, it's, uh, for me, the difference between the tropical rainforest and living in the desert, which is uh, uh, was the place I chose to live, is if you're familiar, there's a wonderful children's book, and it's called The Velveteen Rabbit. And for me, living in a desert is like the Velveteen Rabbit. It's an incredibly rich and dense story. But then I go to the tropics so that I can get a little better Tolstoy, because it's big and deep as far as the stories go. I want to get my little widget over here, make sure I'm all set up. Make sure that's working. Yes. It should be on, and that should be your right slide. Eep. OK, good. So I was young once, and uh, that's where the long hair and the, I worked at the museum where mutton chops and looking like a northern explorer seemed to be the way to go. And uh, as you said, I first started in animal behavior on army ants, and then I went into entomology where they, not only was I in charge of all the orders of insects for which we had no curator, but I was also the answer man. And if you want to talk to a bunch of crazy people, all you have to do is be the answer man at the Museum of Natural History so that you get calls. My favorite to this date is uh, I have a white cockroach. Aha, uh -huh. is it worth a lot of money? <laughs> well, no, not really. It's just molted its skin. And you, you know, you want to get technical or whatever. And the guy goes, ah, oh, you're just trying to chew me down, aren't you? I said, no. And I realized I wasn't going anywhere with it. So I said, do you have the albino cockroach? And he said, yes, I do. And I said, great. What I want you to do is call me in the morning if it's still white. Because <laughs> sometimes logic doesn't really work. Uh, in the middle of all that, at the museum, we had T.C. Schneller, who's the fellow I worked with initially in animal behavior. And he worked on army ants. And there was a Nobel Prize being given out for animal behavior, and they decided they wanted to depict an army ant colony. Nobody had ever done that. This is a million ants who are generally aggravated and are not all that fond of people. And so I had to figure out a way with a fellow by the name of Howard Topoff. Uh, we figured out a way of going into the tropics and then carrying all of our gear, generators and everything else, in a box to bring back a million ants. And so then, when we aspirated them up with a vacuum cleaner, the rules were the vacuum cleaner could have, you know a vacuum cleaner hose is ribbed? It couldn't be ribbed, because if you're an ant and you get sucked up down a vacuum cleaner tube, by the time you get to the other part, you're a bunch of little ants, segments. So we had to work all that out. And then, once we had them, I had to get them on an airplane. I bought a first class ticket seat and flew them into New York City. And I got to tell you, the custom, the first time I did it, I've done it five times. The first time I did it, the custom guy said, that box would just be full of drugs. We got to open it. And I'm at the airport. And I'm going, oh, please. This, there's, like, there's like a million ants that sting in here. And the fellow looks at me and he goes, well, I'm the customs inspector. And I takes a hammer and a screwdriver, and he's getting ready to whack the box. And I just stepped back in line, and I said, I am not responsible for what is going to happen. Because we were willing to pay to have an inspector come when we opened them up at the museum. Anyway, we had some issues, amongst them the fact that uh, the exhibit was so popular that outside of the museum, the main rotunda, there was a line that stretched a block and a half around with people wanting to see army ants. And so they left the doors open in the middle of winter. Well, they're tropics. So they died. And the next thing that happened was I came in after a weekend, and they said, gosh, you got to go back, and we got to get the exhibit back up again right away. And one of our trustees was a banker, and he gave me a big old envelope full of $100 bills. And he goes, and I don't want to hear about how much it costs. It's off the books. <laughs> so I got to go back and get another colony. And so I also fooled around with them a little bit. Like I got cut, and I let the ants be my stitches on my finger and suture them together. Actually worked very well. 
And you know, it's like having a portable medical kit. The, uh, <coughs> and I did have them rain on me once and I got stung so much that, or so many times that I got allergic and I started to blow up. And so they gave me a big old shot of adrenaline uh, in, and then antihistamines in order to help with that. But my favorite part was once I had them at the museum, uh, we, this is a chemical that keeps them from climbing out called fluon. The ants were here and we just had mobs of people standing around this huge area. And um, I could get the ants by putting out mealworms and, and fly maggots to write your name. So I'd say, what's your name? Joy. And I would get the ants to write out Joy. And I used to say, well, you know, for a bug guy, it was a nice way to meet somebody. Uh, so now I got to figure out, ah, here we go. So that led to my doing it not only in Panama, but then doing it in Trinidad for the BBC. They were doing a movie called The Micronauts, and they needed a bunch of ants to go to England. And the, the big difference with the army ants, and they have no respect, you'll notice they're right here in the middle of and you know, uh, pesticide. Uh, but the big thing about them is the army ants in South America, New World army ants, have these big jaws and they sting like a wasp. So they can kill you. Uh, versus the driver ants in Africa, which have much shorter job, uh, jaws, but they're well serrated. So uh, what I used to say is, one will kill you, the other one will kill you and eat you. So it's a completely different kind of critter. So this got me looking for places to, uh, to go and find the ants where I didn't need a horse and three days of packing up the mountains and then trying to get out with the ants in one piece, et cetera. And it ended up that there was a place set up by William Beebe called Simla in Trinidad. It's an old research station which had been bought by the Azorite Nature Center or had been given to the Azorite Nature Center so they would preserve it. And it's right off the coast of Venezuela. There's Trinidad. And because of its closeness, you get a lot of continental animals that just go across the uh, seven miles uh, on a log and end up on the mainland. So in Trinidad, the uh, speciation is incredibly high. The other is, so uh, if you go here and you go up into the northern range to the Azorite Nature Center, which is right there, uh, we're right in the middle of a valley and the, the island is actually still pretty small. I mean, we have ranches that are bigger than this where I live. It's uh, 30 by 50 miles. But the economy changed from agricultural to oil uh, when oil was discovered in the coastal region in here and they actually started picking up quite a lot of revenue from that. So it's never been one of those islands that thought, oh, we gotta have a lot of tourism. You really don't care all that much about it. The Azerite Nature Center was perfect for me. It's up in the mountains uh, and it is an old coffee and cocoa plantation. And when you all are buying coffee and you hear about people saying shade grown, right? The good part about shade grown coffee is that it preserves all of the forest. So that upper canopy is uh, the wildlife that's there, which in the tropics is a huge amount is doing very well. And because of that, this uh, place was sad. Well, like we say right there, they always say you can get 75 to 90 species of birds before breakfast, uh, just sitting at the veranda. And <clears throat> we also have a colony of oil birds, which are big owl-like birds that feed on uh, nut palms, seeds. And, uh, and so this is the old nature center as a painting so I started going there and I did something that, uh, I was there, I was working on a couple of projects and my field hands asked, they said, listen, I, I tell them, what do you want? I, you know, I'm gonna come back, I'll bring you what, do you, what do you need, a little recorder or this, that or the other thing? And they all, they all said, no, you know, everybody comes here and takes pictures and we never get to see them. So why don't you bring us back pictures? So I schlepped a projector and slides and a couple of long shows and I sat down, we had all the field hands and their families come in and I gave them talks on the animals that they lived with. And that started a relationship that's been, well, that's 
well over uh, 45 years old. I know the kids, the grandkids, and everybody else in that area because of that one beginning, which is sharing. And one of our endemic birds is the motmot, this species. So again, why is that place so unique? Because of the coffee, which actually has its fruit, flowers and fruit on the uh, main branches and the trunk, and because of the coffee. Those two things, shade grown, made all the difference and allowed us to buy it and really you know, move it forward. And so the relationship now, which is 50 years, is uh, really very positive. And these trees are just everywhere. So when you walk through the forest, you really don't know what a cocoa tree or a coffee tree is. You just think you were in the jungle. You really wouldn't see it. And we have very strict rules about collecting and killing and how we move things through and getting the community involved in harvesting, et cetera. The first time I went, they were cleaning out all of the epiphytes on the coffee trees. And I looked and as I was walking along, I said, well, there's like $10,000 worth of plants on the ground. Uh, because they just, they call them all pines. They strip them all off so that the flowers come out and you get a nice bean or a nice pod, excuse me. The main thing for me was, while I was there, was starting, is learning how to look up. Why we walk around, oh yeah, look at this, look at that. And then all of a sudden I picked my head up and I went, wow, look at all the stuff all over my head. So in this case, the, the, again, as I was saying, oops, excuse me. Uh, as I was saying, the, the epiphytes really make for an unbelievable array of wildlife. I'm not a birder. I was an entomologist. I mean, I like birds because they carry really cool parasites, but it's not my main focus for why I go look at them. Uh, but the whole idea that bees would be exposed out in the trees, that these leaves would all of a sudden get up and take a look at you, uh, that you know, the, the wild, eating was an aerial endeavor uh, that we had actually porcupines that are prehensile tail and live in the trees. All of that gave me the opportunity to really relax, to not be in a hurry. I'm not to look at something and then spend time with it. That's the most important part of what I consider to being a field biologist. Also, I was very lucky. I was. Uh, walking around with all these stories in my head, and I'd go to a magazine, discover natural history, natural geography, and I'd say, wow, I got, you know, I'm thinking about this critter. And they'd say, oh, okay, well, go photograph it, goodbye. So it was, I had like 30 self-generated stories that I was able to do because of wonderful clients. So one, one that was fun for me is I was always looking at the Azteca ants. So these paper nests are full of these little ants that are about an eighth of an inch that spray acid and bite like lunatics. I mean, they have no fear. And because of the fact that they're so aggressive, uh, <coughs> army ants won't climb those trees. They just come out and make a ring, start spraying acid, the army ants back up. Well, the flip side to that is wasps have figured that out. And so all of these nests are surrounded by big wasp nests and they protect them. So, okay, and I'd sit, because I like the ants, I'd watch the ants and I'd fiddle with them to see what they were doing, et cetera. But one day I looked up and I had some ants fall on me and I looked up and I said, whoa, what's going on here? And what it was, was that the trogans were banging into these ant nests and they were just opening up their wings and holding on and they'd just get brown with ants. And then they'd fly over to a branch and the eyes and the membrane would come over and they'd slowly, and then they'd wiggle a whole bunch and get the ants off them and they were anting. We think about our uh, foxes and woodpeckers and other animals doing it on ant colonies of our thatch ants, but this was an aerial use of the ants. The other thing that I was always interested in, so I'm a little bug. And now I gotta go find water. So where, or I have babies that I wanna raise, et cetera. Where can I do that? And I started looking at bromeliads. And the bromeliads really are just that, ponds in the sky. The middle of all these leaves are full of water. 
And so there's a whole group of animals in the tropics that specialize in finding bromeliads. Not only that, but many other animals like butterflies, etc., come in and they will literally uh, go to the, the bromeliad to take a drink instead of going uh, down onto the ground. So in this case, uh, I found a species of scorpion way up on top of El Tacuch, just the highest mountain, <coughs> over 9,000 feet on the island. And excuse me. <coughs> and it ended up being a new species of scorpion. And so uh, it was named after myself and, and a buddy of mine, Hans. The other was uh, something like this crab is on top of the mountain in Bromeliads, and the, it's the, the mountain chain that goes along Venezuela that also uh, is sort of turns over, and Trinidad's been traveling along it. The Bromeliad, the top of those mountains are very old, and what uh, I sent the crab to the Smithsonian, they said, well, you know, it's a female, bring me a male, and, and I said, whoa, wait a minute, I just had to hike for three days to bring you this one crab. <laughs> I don't think so. But this, is a, this species of crab is endemic only to the top of the mountains in Trinidad. There are other terrestrial ones that are red, but this one is only on top. Another thing, ant colonies are in the bromeliads. They use the fronds, the fronds to keep it together. Uh, there are frogs, like this marsupial frog, that carry their eggs around on their back. And just when they're ready to uh, to emerge, the tadpoles, they'll go and sit in the bromeliad, open their back. They literally go crack, and they open it up, and they swim out. So, uh, and then they complete metamorphosis in just a few days. They go right down, they feed up, but they've done 99% of their growing on the back of the frog. The, uh, the other one that I've always enjoyed is this guy. So you're a little caterpillar and everybody wants to eat you. So what are you going to do? So in the end, uh, what they do is they go and find the leaf and they cut, in, they bite into the leaf. And the rubbers and protective juices of the leaf all come up. And then they eat the leaf in the middle, knowing that things like ants and other stuff can't get to them. So that's actually a protective ring made by the caterpillar before it starts eating. So another one here is your peanut-headed bug. bug. Uh, it's a good size, about that big. It's a full gourd, but I mean, it's a peanut-headed bug. And uh, Isabella, who had lived in Trinidad and then in Venezuela, had said that these guys lit up. And people were collecting them and couldn't find them and said, you know, just another crazy story from the field. Well, they're not easy to get a lot of them. And finally, somebody collected a bunch and when they were all together, started competing, they would glow. So it wasn't one at a time. You could have one anytime you wanted. It's not going to do it for you. There's no sex involved in being around with you. So the other one over here, for instance, is uh, some of these clear-winged butterflies that just disappear as they're flying around the flowers as you're going in. And of course, this is uh, one of the uh, shieldback bugs, and she protects her eggs. So she has a. T if anybody here has ever put a, a a plant bug in your mouth, eating a berry, like you're eating strawberries and you're in a hurry. Uh, probably not. Uh, but anyway, if you do, woohoo, you know why you don't eat stink bugs. Uh, but what she does is she sits on top of her eggs, and if anything comes near her, she'll just let off gases. And that protects the eggs until they hatch. And she also just hun hunkers down on them. However, on top of El Tecuch, also, it's very famous, there is a bromeliad tree frog. Its entire metamorphosis goes on, and its life goes on in bromeliads on top of a mountain, on top of the trees, in the mist that the mountain has as the winds go through it. And so that's the tadpole for it. And what the tadpoles do is they'll be in one brack, one, one part of the leaf, and they'll eat out all the uh, protozoans and other kinds of animals that are in there, and then they wiggle over and they get in another bunch. And so when they're done, the bromeliad's pretty well cleaned out. And they're quite beautiful, and you will uh, you almost never see them in captivity. As a matter of fact, I've never seen anybody keep them because they're a high altitude and cold environment, and bringing them down the mountain is enough to kill them.
another. So years ago, I really wanted to do a story on Enviad Man, but they'd already done Spider-Man. But see, Spider-Man is wrong because spiders don't si spin silk out of their feet, right? They do it out of their butt. So this whole thing here with him having the web there is very convenient for, for the, you know, the show. But there actually is an animal called an embiid and a web spinner, and they have on their front a little gadget that lets them sp spray silk. So it should have been embiid man. But I would have had to get together with the cartoonist a little earlier than the cartoon character came out. And here, it's hard to see in the, right here, but this little hole, she's come out and she, she's doing it as if she was sewing. She's going like this with the foot. She does it over and over and over again. When this one runs out, she takes the other one and does it over and over again until she spins the silk blanket. Has lots of interesting parts. This animal is primitively eusocial, which means that the female guards her eggs, takes care of them, and when the babies hatch, they live with her, perhaps for one or more generations. However, the females are wingless. This is a female. The males have to find the females. The females are living in these webs all along tree bark. So if you're traveling in the tropics, people will say, oh, it's spider silk. Ah, embiid silk. And when you find them like that, you can actually look in the tunnels and you can see one running along. So there's an interesting thing that happens. She is, as I said, here she is sitting with her eggs and the baby's just hatched out. Here she is guarding it. And you'll notice the strange position of the legs. That's not because there was a problem with the picture. She can run as quickly forward as backwards in the silk tunnel. She doesn't have to turn around. She just goes 80 miles an hour one way, and if she wants to back up, she backs up, hits the tunnel, keeps going. The males have wings, and they fly to find the females. So when they find the female, they put a hole in the web, and they drill down and start chasing her. But she goes just as quickly backwards as forward, and he's got wings. So he has a special hinge. So when he goes backwards, if he gets stuck, it just flips over his head. Then he goes flower and it flips the other way. And that's, how he, that's the way that he can outrun her in the webs. As with many animals, you have to be strong enough to mate. Uh, and he has to do it very quickly because if he doesn't, somebody will come along. Remember, it's on the side of a tree. That's a plica. That's one of the tree lizards. And uh, this fella, I, and the fun part for me, again, I had somebody who said, yeah, go spend a month looking at little black bugs running around on a tree. And... Uh, in the process of taking the pictures, I got a male that landed and a lizard that came in and got him. And so I just had that one picture in a thousand to do it. The other animal that I read about as a kid was the quote unquote missing link, Peripetus. Now, this is macro Peripetus. I got to tri Trinidad and I found one and I ran back to natural history when I had done another story and I said, there's a critter we have got to do a story on. The editor, as usual, said, ah, oh, yeah, I know. It's ugly. It's got no color, and you want to do a story on it. And I said, yep. And he goes, okay, go. So Macroperipetus is, was considered a mi missing link or, or the Peripetus because parts of the anatomy are very arthropod-like, and other parts of the anatomy are very much worm-like. And so they were considered a transitional animal. Biologists at this point in time have said, no, they just broke away a long time ago or are part of a different evolutionary track between uh, peripetous annelid worms and arthropods, but they're not a direct missing link. Of course, they wouldn't be missing, right, because we find them. But <coughs> the nice thing about them for me is they, uh, the females, when they're getting ready to give birth, they just open up the back, sort of like a train or a truck opening up, and the baby walks out. She doesn't lay him. He just walks out. And then, he, and then he'll c climb on her, and he'll spend lots of time in the burrow with her. 
So they have a very, well, these animals are 180 million years old and plus. You know, they have interesting, something had to work out pretty well for them to still be around or they'd be gone. Uh, and so that was part of the story. I was so excited about it, but I had no idea of how they ate. So they've got these antenna, and they are walking along, and the field crickets, grasshoppers, katydids, anything, with their antenna will touch the uh, animal, will touch the peripetus. The peripetus immediately turns around and squirts them with glue. So, and, and that's actually not the eyeball, that's the glue shooting organ on the side. And so the first thing they do is they'll, they'll fire right down the contact point. It glues the animal that they're going to eat, say in this case the, the uh, cricket, and then they go in and they bite it. Now, I can't show you that part of the mouth because I've never gotten a picture of it because it happens so fast. But actually in here, there's a couple of big claws that come out and just rip into the animal that they're going to feed on. Didn't know it was going to be Horror Night, did you? Uh, and then they flip their mouth backwards and this radula comes out, sort of uh, goes up to where the animal is, the cricket, spider, whatever it is, and just sort of sucks them to death that way, just eats them out. By then they're dead. And the other part is, and I've always liked this because I worked on, I designed the first two garbage museums in the United States. Don't waste anything. They go back and eat all the glue. <laughs> so all that's left is just a couple of bug parts on a leaf and everything else is gone. The other thing that I was very fortunate about being a taxonomist and being interested in ants, I'd read a lot about the primitive ants. So the ponorines in particular. And the ponorine ants, uh, you could tell, uh, well, they have this little constriction in the gastric. The other part that's very different for them is that they do not regurgitate water. So if they drink something, it's home. Other ants, like the honeypot ants over here, they fill up with sugars and process them and make something that's exactly like what a bee makes. It's honey. It's reduced carbohydrate. They just filter out the water um, through their body. So I'd read about this. I'd read about the body parts. I'd looked at Linnaeus's work and on and on and on. And I said, well, you know, they must get all their water, which is what everybody extrapolated, from the animals that they kill. So you kill something, and you gut it, and the juices fall out, and that's what you get for water. And that's fine if you're sitting in France and uh, looking at dead bugs. But I was in the field, and the first time I saw one of these guys carrying a drop of water, I said, aha, they were wrong, all those funky hairs. What they're for is that the ants literally go up to a drop of water, they open up their jaws, and they flip the water onto these long hairs, way open. And as soon as the hairs are loaded up, they pop their jaws together and bingo, they have a drop. <clears throat> and that's what they take back to the nest. Now, this I did for Discover Magazine with a, a biologist, a, a very famous guy, Ed Wilson, and he wrote the article. And when I was doing this, what I found was several things that nobody had reported. I, I found that one, they actually will take the drop of water and put it on wood to moisten an area, and that's why they keep their larva in a high humidity environment. And so they're not using it only to drink. The other thing that they do is when they come into the nest, there'll be workers waiting, and they distribute it amongst themselves. So everybody gets a little bit of water, and they run off to feed the larva, et cetera. So in this case, the larva is picking its head up just to get a drink from the female ant. Another thing is, for instance, the pupa are thick, thick uh, silk and it's thick. And what they do is they pile all the pupa up in chambers away from uh, the rest of the larva or anything else. And when the pupa are getting ready to hatch, 
the, it starts to wiggle, and they go over, and this was, uh, this was amazing to watch. They go over and they take water and they soak the top of the pupa. And then they go in and they cut it open. So they're using water in many more ways than we ever thought uh, was uh, possible. And this is one of the little males. They're uh, wonderful ants. Uh, they sting like crazy and they're about, about three quarters of an inch. But if you can get over that, they're a lot of fun to work with. One of the biggest herbivores, if not the biggest herbivore in the New World tropics, are actually leaf cutter ants. Yes, they're taking a little bit of leaf. In a, so it's like taking an elephant and breaking them down into cells and letting it run around in the environment. Uh, and these huge queens are, this is Ada, and the huge queens actually fly. And when they fly, they take a little bit of fun fungus in an infrabugal sac in a place right under their jaw. And they land, they mate, they land, rip off their wings, dig a hole, and lay, put that little bit of silk uh, uh, fungus down. And then they lay eggs, pop the eggs, and slowly grow the fungus. Now, we have fungus growing ants all the way from New Jersey, all the way down through Central and South America. Different kinds. Uh, and we have all the forms. We have some that just go and collect caterpillar droppings and keep them nice and moist so that fungus grows on them and that's what they're eating. So you can see all the stages of the evolution of farming with them. So the nests themselves can be enormous. This stage would be no problem to be in net one nest with one queen and, mil and a million workers all going out into the field, coming back with lines and lines bushels of vegetation in order to do one thing, and that is to grow fungus. And as the fungus starts to produce a fruiting body, which is high in protein, that's what they cut and eat. So they're really farmers. And I always say, well, whatever they do has to grow the fungus well, otherwise they wouldn't be able to get any food. So I'm always thinking about who runs the show. Is it the ants or is it the fungus? The other uh, is that these fungus nests are producing tons of detritus. So the top here will have all the fresh leaves. The middle is where it's all starting to fruit. And then once it's done, the bottom, the brown area, that is basically used up material. So they got to do something with it. So what they do is they literally go underground and they dig these chambers that are as big as I am. I could literally walk right into one. And that's where all the detritus goes in. And, and so they have these gigantic midden piles. In those midden piles, deep underground, I'm talking 15 feet more, these, these midden piles deep underground are full of all kinds of beetles and flies and things that really specialize on eating that material. And as a result, you also get things like this legless lizard, they go right down the ant colonies. Everybody say, oh, they're eating the baby ants or they're eating the fungus. Or, and I was lucky because I found where the road cut had opened up into a midden pile. So above this, there's about another 15 feet before the edge, right? Well, they're not the brightest things in the world. So they cut into a midden pile and they kept filling it. They never figured out that it was full. And so this is all the midden that they've been throwing out. So some biologists from Scotland, and if you want to work with some real wackos, work with the Scottish. There's nothing like them. And uh, <clears throat> so they had been setting traps, and they'd gotten this amphithema, this, leg this legless lizard. And uh, they said, oh, we want to find out what they're eating. We're going to kill them. And I said, no, 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 wait a minute. Uh, let's not kill them and gut them. Let me have them. We're going to put them in a, clear, in a clean box, and I'll collect the feces. They said, what are you going to do with that? I said, I'll dissolve it, and I'll look for bug parts or, you know, what, whatever's in it. So I went in, and I found a preponderance of little spiracles, which are the breathing parts for an insect. And those little sp black spiracles, I, I brought them all out, laid them out, and I said, this, whatever this caterpillar is, that's their primary food. 
And then we went over and I had found this min pod. We dug it up and we found these caterpillars and that's what the spiracles were. So they're actually going down, way down 10 feet or more underground to these big min chambers and eating out the caterpillars or the, excuse me, the beetle larva. Uh, the, and when they're done with whatever's in there, they might come up and go and find another nest to go and uh, get the food from. But right here, we also found four, sp I, I had some entomologists with me. I thought they were gonna just pass out because in the middle of all this, we found four species of beetles that had never been seen before, several species of flies, because in order to be able to get this, you need to hire a tractor and dig down 10, 12 feet in the middle of a jungle, not something that's easy to do. And so this is a young colony, and this is my son looking at me going, I know, yeah, you want me to stand by ants. Uh, Another place that I love to go through in the tropics, now remember each one of these things could be a book in all honesty. I'm just giving you some, I want you to think about when you're in, in the tropics that this world, this, this incredible encyclopedia is all around you. Pages are constantly opening. It's just whether you have the time and you've done the research in order to understand what's going on. But we would go into the mangrove swamps and everybody was looking for the Oh, the birds that are in the mangroves, of which are quite a lot, the scarlet ibis, et cetera. I was crazy for the termites. So the termite nests, these Nazuti termites make these beautiful mud nests up in the trees, especially in the mangroves. There's water underneath, so they have to be totally above ground. And there's a, spe there's a, a little fella, it's called a silky anteater, and they dig into the nest, make holes in them, and initially what they do is they crack open the nest and they'll get the workers that are right there. Then all the soldiers come out. Well, these fellas have a head that is like a long tube. It's a chemical tank. And they mix the chemicals together and they fire out a line of acid. So as soon as it gets too intense for the anteater, they just move over, they start over here. So they're not feeding in the sense that you would say, oh, they're gonna rip the nest apart. They're just taking little bits out of what's going on. The queens, which are, oh, probably anywhere from an inch to an inch and a half when they're, it's a word called physogastric, full of eggs. Uh, the queens are in the middle of that ball, and so they're totally safe. So it's gleaning. What you find is that most animals in the tropics don't destroy a food source, they just glean parts of it. And, and of course, there's, there's always birds, and so we get nice spectacle owl, and in this case, boas. There's always boas overhead when we're going, uh, and especially at night, because their eyes shine, and it's sort of fun between them and the, uh, the, the uh, uh, birds flying over your head. However, we have a one, for me, it was a really uh, very satisfying a part of the conservation effort in Trinidad was for the leatherback turtles. <clears throat> when I first went to Trinidad, I'd go to the beach during the laying season, and what you find were the leatherbacks with their fins cut off, still alive, laying on the sand. And then you'd find, you know, sticks, and the, guy, the, the uh, fishermen and the, who were harvesting would just put the fish, the stick in the sand until they came up with wetness from the eggs. Then they'd dig them out and take them for cooking. Yeah, taking the eggs is sort of an abstract thing, but really finding an animal that's almost the size of a small car with its fins cut off and still flailing with blood shooting around is tough to take. And uh, I, especially I was just heartbroken. So what? Uh, through the Azorite Nature Center and the conservation in the communities, we said, let's make, there's an, gotta be another way to make money than doing this to the turtles. So they started out a program where now they, are, they uh, tag the turtles, and when you go and visit, you can have a turtle named after you. So on the record, for 25 bucks, hey, you know, that's, that's life, money, money, money. Uh, for $25, that turtle will always have your name on. And they have now set up beach patrols. And the entire 
ethos of those communities has changed and they now realize how wonderful and valuable these animals are. So there are many victories in conservation. It's just that if you're there from the beginning sometimes, it's rather painful to see where it starts uh, in, in the process of moving forward. And they, what, the, the main thing is, you watch, see, they come, they're enormous. It, how many of you have seen leatherback turtles? All right. You know, when they come in, that's quite a sight. And they come out of the ocean, and they sit around and pant a lot, and they come out a little bit further. And eventually, they get to a high water mark that they think is going to survive storms, et cetera. Instinctually, I'm sure they're not having a conference about it. And uh, <coughs> they then start to dig. And, they, and because of the shape of their fins, they sh they, uh, the flippers, they actually dig a hole that's like a bowl. So they're not straight down. It sort of comes down and then goes around. And that's where they drop their eggs. Once they're egg laying, that's it. They are totally committed. Before that, <coughs> when they just start digging, et cetera, if you go in and disturb them with lights and the like, they'll shuffle off and go back into the ocean again. So we wait until the eggs are dropping in good way. She's always, you know, there's always tears coming out, but that's really a matter of cleaning the eyes from the sand and salt water. And then several months later, you get all the baby turtles come out and, and run for the ocean. So some, we, some are collected and held in order to ensure 100% uh, survival, at least for that little group. But most of them are just left alone. It's now, it went from one, once in a while seeing a turtle. We have hundreds of turtles coming in now after over 30 years of working with this. So it is a real success story for a very large animal. And <clears throat> it's still tough. You go early in the morning, and all the babies are hatching out, and they're as cute as a button. They're about that big with little fins on them, and they come scambling out of the hole. They all come up together. That's how they dig out from being about two feet underground. It's not individual young coming out. They sort of burrow through. So what, uh, so what happens is they come up. Vultures, black-headed vultures, every animal that can eat a baby turtle is there in numbers. So it's a massacre, but it's, now there's waves of turtles growing through, and that makes a big difference. So in ending, I wish to take the, org the three organizations that are here. Caligo Ventures is uh, an old friend, and she said, oh, I want, they, I want you to do a, a talk for me. And uh, you don't ha I said, I'm not doing birds. She said, oh, you don't have to do birds. She said, you can talk about the rest of the world. Uh, and for me, it's all the rest of the world is little stuff. But there is, and one of the things that I've always uh, had to thank have been great clients who have, you know, I come up with some squirrely idea about wanting to photograph something that nobody's seen. And they go, yeah, sure, go ahead. How, how long do you want? Usually I do it in the winter so I can get to the tropics, spend most of the cold season down there. But they're, they're okay with that. The other is uh, you get to see all of these wonderful animals that through photography, through stories, uh, you get to represent and help defend. And to me, that's a very important part of using knowledge with the visitors and with the public in order to get them turned on. So not only would you maybe want to go on a field trip and not only look at birds, but look at birds and. I always say nothing should exclude, should be all of it is available, it's just a matter of seeing it. And so in this case, because every, every conversation should end with a little bit of sex, I don't know how many of you have ever know what a spermatophore is. Anybody? Spermatophore? Insects do not have open sperm in the reproductive process. The male literally has an egg. It's called a spermatophore. And many insects, especially walking sticks, you'll see will have specialized organs in the back when they're mating, and that's to inject the spermatophore into the female. She will then take it, night with ants, Though that egg mass having millions of, of sperm in it is nurtured 
fed and held so that as each egg goes out, she lets out one sperm cell. So it's an incredible process. And just think about it, it's going on in some, some cases in insects that you can barely see that are driving your sugar bowl crazy uh, at home. But this incredible biology is going on right there in your house. So people would call me up in New York and say, oh my God, I got roaches in the apartment, what kind? Oh, we got brown banded roaches. And I'd say, aren't you lucky? And then, you know, then they'd look at you and I knew they were gonna come and beat me up, so I'd have to give them some help. Uh, or, you know, you got your frogs that are carrying the tadpoles, laying them on dry land and then carrying them into the stream so they can complete metamorphosis. Uh, there's nothing is random. That to me is the most incredible part about being in the field, is that as you look around, there are just tens of thousands of incredible stories uh, that you can enjoy while you're enjoying the air and looking at a tree as a tree. And I always tell friends, you know, there was a time when I looked at a tree and all I thought was, oh, chlorophyll and the actions. And, and then one day I looked at the tree and I said, wow, that's really pretty. <laughs> Everything changed. And of course, then you have to have a son who looks at you and goes, yeah, dad, okay. <laughs> so uh, it is, this happens to be one of the big silk moths from Trinidad. Everything you've seen is from Trinidad. This is one of the <coughs> big silk moths from Trinidad, and they sit on a, on, the, on a side of a tree looking like a tent. So a butterfly has its wings either up or out. Moths have their, butterfly, uh, their wings uh, in a tent form. That's one of the easy ways to tell them apart. The other one is that butterflies have, have uh, antenna that are like a string with a little bowl at the end, where moths have a uh, fluffy antenna with lots of little uh, projections that are used primarily for males to find females. Females put on a attracting pheromone and the males can sit there. In some cases, we track them coming over 10 miles and finding the female. Uh, but when you look at it carefully, you might find that there's really a lot more going on inside of what those wings. It's like you're stepping into another universe. And if you do it, especially after a few rum punches, you might find that there's a whole new world that you're dropping into. And that would be the best gift you could give yourself is to keep looking. And thank you all very much. record. <laughs> First, thanks so much. That was really entertaining and enlightening. Um, I'm a fifth grade teacher here in the Valley, and our guiding question right now that I'm studying with my kids is, why do scientists study the rainforest? So I was just wondering how you would answer that. I hope. Uh, I guess from my, how do, why do scientists study the rainforest? Of course, the diversity of everything that's, that's around you in the rainforest alone, the way that all the problems have been solved. Niches are a hallmark of going into an environment and saying we get, and they've done this, we gas the tree and put nets underneath it and collected all the animals and gotten thousands of species of animals out of one tree. They're not all living on top of each other. Everybody has got its point. So that's one reason. The other one is there's no end to the question. Asking questions is a, a great way to live. And so I would tell kids, because you can have a lot of fun, and, no, and the hardest part for me about science, especially when I, was, uh, when I started teaching at universities, et cetera, was we present information often as if it's been solved. Memorize this. Well, it's okay at a battle. You know, it started on February and then, science isn't about that, it's open-ended. So, 
the fun part of going into the tropics is that every one of these stories has another eight stories behind it that need to be told. And so it's not a curiosity never ends. And you'll never be bored. I don't care what you're doing for a living. If you're, if you're a naturalist, a biologist, uh, the world is always going to be open to you. So that, more than solving the world health crisis, more than finding drugs that are going to you know, cure cancer, all of that's possible. But it's not an either or. The other one is fundamentally uh, keeping a curious mind. That's the most important part. Anybody else? The the scorpion that was named after you and a colleague. What mm -hmm. what is that name? Do you remember? <coughs> Ray, it's Raymond B Raymond Hans Buzai. And I'm Raymond. <laughs> and my friend's name is Hans. <laughs> and who's the colleague? He's from Trinidad. He was the uh, uh, Hans is the was the curator. Uh, and director of the Emperor Valley Zoo. And uh, we met years ago when I was, I was showing the slides. Remember I started by saying that I was showing the locals pictures that I'd taken of the, because they asked, they said, you know, nobody ever shows this. Well, there was a fella by the name of Herbert Kitchen who was there with a big photography class. And he came over and he said, um, can I, uh, I'd like to have my class attend your lecture and then critique your photographs. Okay. So I said, sure, I, I'd love that. And so they all came. And Hans, had, I didn't know Hans and his brother were both, Julius, were both at the dining room at the HRA Nature Center. And they both came over, and real Trinidad, typical Trinidad. Yaman, those guys, they got a lot of nerve. Ah, da, 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 da. And I said, no, you know, there's, there's always a point that helps you grow. I don't mind. And I was very lucky at the end of it, Herman turned around, looked at his class and said, well, obviously there's nothing for me to say about the quality of the picture. <laughs> um, and we talked a little bit about technique, but just that interaction, that momentary interaction, and the fact that I come back to Trinidad to present the Trinidadians. I didn't do it for a tour, I didn't do it for tourists, nothing like that, but for the Trinidadians. They invited me then to come back and talk to the Field Naturalist Club which is a very important uh, naturalist club in Trinidad. And it just started, you know, the whole, the whole ball rolling. So that's how, and then everywhere I go, because he was the director of the zoo, he could take time. Uh, and he had a car, because they drive on the other side of the road. Uh, and so we would go on all these adventures to go and find stuff. And he'd learn and I'd learn. If nothing else, I learned the Trinidadian name for things. <laughs> outside his jetty and all the animals that were in there and just when you're going outside there's just everything's running around not alone you know at 9,000 feet what's living out there but right you know down, down right that's why I took you from the beach yeah. you know back up to the mountains and the other thing is that and it, since you're you lived in Tobago uh, for for a long time it sounds like the other thing is Trinidadians have the most oddball sense of humor in the entire world. So I spent so much time, I'd get there and what's the latest song? So uh, there's a song about the, uh, the, the, the field hand ending up with the queen in England because there had been a break into the castle. And so there's this great song that I just played the other day just about that. Everything was either a newspaper article uh, or uh, a, a uh, one of the carnival songs would come out about whatever was going on. <laughs> you know, is, uh, for all of you, just think of it this way. So I get to Trinidad and the newspaper has got a headline, Island Sinking Under Pigs. <laughs> I said, what? So I'm trying to figure it out. And so they, had a, they wanted to be able to start a uh, processing factory for pigs in Trinidad. And so they went to England and they got injections 
for uh, the, the swine flu so that they could process the pigs and export them. Sounds good, except nobody reads. So the, the medication was put in and it was too soon. And so the fear was that they were giving the pigs the swine flu. So there was a big program and everybody had to come in and tell them how many pigs they had and how many pigs they had to kill, et cetera, et cetera. So the numbers that came in engendered a story of the island sinking on the pigs. Because everybody, even if you only had two, now had 100. Because <laughs> you were going to get compensated for it. So everything is like that. Everything was a slight off-center twist to the world. Awesome. Thank you so much to Ray. And I know he'll stick around it and entertain more conversation. And just thank you so much. And thanks for well, all of you for coming. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>